oh, that's nice. You don't Ooh. usually hear that. They've added that for the first time. Right. So, hello, and welcome to The Real American Revolution, a special program where we interview prominent authors and historians who specialize in the American Revolution and to really discuss what really happened during that period of American history. Now, today I'm delighted to have Professor Colin G. Calloway as my guest, the foremost expert, in my opinion, on Native American involvement during the American Revolution. Professor Calloway is the John Kimball Jr. 1943 Professor of History and Native American Studies at Dartmouth College. His books include The Indian World of George Washington, The Scratch of a Pen, and The Victory with No Name. He's the recipient of numerous awards, including the American Indian History Lifetime Achievement Award. And today we'll be talking about uh, talking with him about his very popular bestseller, The American Revolution in Indian Country. So, Professor, welcome to the Real American Revolution. Thank you, Randy. It's a pleasure to be here. Glad to have you. So, what inspired you to write a book about the American Revolution in Indian Country? Well, I think and. Um... Our, our, list, our viewers should should know this is a, a book. If I was inspired, it was a very long time ago. <laughs> this, this book came out in 1995. Um, so the generic answer, I think, for all of my books is that I basically think I want to write a book if I don't have that book. Right? If there isn't a book about this, okay, I'll write it. Mm -hmm. right? It's that simple, apparently. Um, but I think that what drew me to the, the American Revolution. So many of um, my, myself and my colleagues who work in Native American history, the goal of, of us many often is to kind of get Indians in a meaningful way into American history. And in the 18th century, it frustrated me that there really wasn't um, the kind of scholarship that I was looking for on Native Americans in the American Revolution, which seemed crazy because the American Revolution in many ways is the American story. And it involves Native Americans, African Americans, all, all kinds of Americans. Uh, and yet they really weren't there in a way that we could get a handle on. Um, and I, I felt I was somewhat positioned to do that because being British, I'd I'd done my first book on British relations with Native Americans mm -hmm. in the period after the revolution. So I had an idea of the of the British document uh, resource, and I knew that the Indians were all over the place. It just made no sense for them not to be in the story of the American Revolution. So I thought I'd, I'd give it a shot. But um, even as starting out, I knew it was a daunting task. So... Uh, I knew that I couldn't do the story and what I would need to do was select certain stories that um, focus on, 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 on different Indian nations uh, to represent some of the diversity that, uh, of experiences in Indian country. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Well, in the very beginning of your book, you state the national mythology accords Indians a minimal and negative role in the story of the revolution. They chose the wrong side and they lost. Mm -hmm. And then you go on to state, we cannot tell the full story of the revolutionary America without including American Indians. Do you explain what you mean by that? That's a question I'm often asked. You know, what do you mean? <laughs> um, and of course, if we go right to the, to the Declaration of Independence, which of course is a foundational document of the nation and fundamental to the revolution, Jefferson really kind of says it there, right? That um, among the grievances against King, King George and his government is that they have leashed, unleashed on the frontiers the, what he calls the savages with their ferocious method of warfare that spares nobody. So right from the moment of its birth, it seems that Indians are fighting against that birth. They are positioned as enemies of what Americans are fighting for, which is freedom. Um, and they side with the British, which represent, represent tyranny. So right from the start, they're kind of at the wrong, on the wrong side of history. And having sided with the British 
in the fight against American independence, it therefore becomes um, almost justifiable to exclude them, to exclude Native Americans from the new nation that's, that's built as a result of that independence. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that struck me um, very early on, and I've always um, kind of adhered to this, is that for Americans, the revolution was a war about independence, of course. But for many Americans, it was also a war about Indian land and getting access to Indian land. Mm -hmm. Americans wanted that access. They did not want that access restricted or uh, monopolized by the British. Mm -hmm. right? So it's a war for independence and it's a war for land. For Indian people, it's a war for their land, but it's also a war for their independence because they see in this struggle um, basically an existential threat to them as sovereign nations and to people with their own way of life. Um, so I think broadening the scope of uh, the war for independence to include multiple participants uh, gives us a richer and, and fuller um, purchase on, on what the revolution was all about. Mm -hmm. Well, you specifically focus on eight prominent tribal communities that include, you know, tribal nation names with which many Americans may or may not be familiar. Mm -hmm. uh, Abenaki, Stockbridge, Iroquois, Shawnee, Cherokee, yeah. Chickasaw, and Seminole. Why did you select those particular communities and what is their significance? Yeah. As I was thinking about how am I going to do this, it's kind of the standard case, case study model, and that is two, three. Um, I was never very math, but that wasn't the reason. Uh, I just realized that that was not going to work for this. And I knew that there were some tribal nations who had to be there. The Iroquois had to be there, of course. But the Iroquois were the Six Nations, and there were multiple communities within those Six Nations. So what I did was choose uh, a relatively small um, Iroquois nation, Aquaga or Onaquaga, which was a kind of a composite community, uh, which was caught up in the war in the Susquehanna Valley, and then looked at Fort Niagara as a, a community that kind of came into being as a result of the war. It's almost a refugee community after General Sullivan's expedition through Iroquois country mm -hmm. uh, propelled Indian people to the British fort at Niagara. I knew I had to talk about the Cherokees because the Cherokees were early, were in the war early for their own reasons. And there's a really interesting story of, uh, within the Cherokee nation of how the decision to go to war and participate in the revolution plays out uh, to do with Cherokee policies of appeasement by older chiefs, the frustrations of young men, et cetera. I knew I had to have um, a case study for the Ohio Valley where the tug of war diplomatically and then militarily was, was key. Uh, and in some ways the uh, an obvious choice would have been the Delaware because the Delaware signed the Treaty of Fort Pitt, the first treaty, uh, Indian treaty signed by the United States after independence and its second treaty after the treaty with the French. Um, but I wanted to look at the Shawnee because it seemed to me the Shawnee had such an interesting history of migration and resistance uh, and they were key players in the multi-tribal resistance movement that grew up before the American Revolution and continued after the revolution. I wanted to um, have a, a community that representative of the, the North, Northeast. Um, and I'd written a book on the on Western Abenaki of, of Vermont. Uh, so that gave me a, a kind of a it was a little bit of a stepping stone. I felt a little, you know, okay, I kind of know the territory here. Um, and so I chose the, the Abenaki community of Odenak on the St. Lawrence uh, outside uh, Montreal, 
And that was one reason for choosing that community. The other reason was that by choosing that community, I was not able to do the neighboring community, Mohawk community of Ganawaki or Gokunawaga, um, because I knew from going through the British records that that was, that was a book in itself. That was a nightmare of complexity. And I didn't feel like I could handle that in one chapter. Um, I wanted an example of a native community that sided with the Americans. And so that was, I, I uh, chose the a community of Stockbridge, Massachusetts, which had grown up as a, as a mission community, but men from Stockbridge were among the first um, volunteers uh, to, to side with the Americans. They turned up at the, at the, at the siege of Boston. Um, I needed uh, communities from the Southeast and I chose the Seminoles because I wanted to um, trace the story of an Indian nation that kind of came into being at about the same time as the American Revolution because so often in American history, if we're looking at a, an event in American history, the, the mirror if you'll experience of Indian people is automatically assumed to be one of demise, the rise of the, Ameri of the United States means the decline of, of Indian. Well, the Seminoles basically come into existence as a separate nation uh, during this time period. They, um, they emerge as uh, offshoots people who've migrated from um, Creek towns, the Creek Confederacy in Georgia, Alabama, mm. and move into, into Northern Florida. And their actual military participation in the revolution may be minimal, but it was a good, um, served as a good counterpoint. The United States was not the only polity doing nation building at the time. The Seminoles were emerging. Mm -hmm. And then the Chickasaws, um, I actually remember the moment when I decided that I needed to do the Chickasaws. I, I had almost, I thought, um, was closing in on, on, on the final shape of, of, of the book. And I remember this was in a time period when I used to commute between Wyoming and Vermont. because I was working in, at the University of Wyoming and my wife and as child were in Vermont. So I did a lot of flying back and forth, which was never my favorite thing to do. And I remember taking off from Denver airport in a, in a snowstorm. Um, so I was doing some pretty intense thinking and it dawned on me that I needed a chapter from the Southwest for what was then the Southwest, which meant either the Chickasaws or the Choctaws. And it's, those of our audience who've, who've written books will will know once once you realize that there's something that you have to do that there is actually a hole in the book you're writing you're done you have to do it you I mean, it just drives you nuts <laughs> so then it was a choice was it would i do the chickasaws or the choctaws and again having worked through british indian records uh, for quite a bit i knew that the telling the choctaw story was was immense mm -hmm. um and the Choctaw story intrigued me because right at the beginning, Choctaws were a population of 20, 30,000 people. Chickasaws were a relatively tiny group. But right at the beginning of the revolution, the, the Americans Congress sends them a message basically saying, you'd better um, side with us or we're gonna come and pay you a visit. And the Chickasaws respond and say, basically, bring it on. <laughs> you, know, you may get your heads broken. Uh, they had a, a, a certain reputation in that area. Yeah. Um, so it's a little bit, I felt it was a little bit like selecting textbooks or, or reading book readings for, for a class that you're teaching. Mm -hmm. When you choose one book, it means that you can't use another book because it's, it's too close and there's overlap. I could have sliced the pizza lots of different ways and, and come up with um, just as many um, interesting communities and with, with multiple pairings in, in some ways. Interesting. 
Well, as the European settlements began to grow, of course, in North America and encroach upon native lands, these tribal nations had to figure out how to deal with the French, the Spanish, the mm -hmm. English. How did they do that? How did they sort that out? Yeah. And I think that is one of the huge challenges for, for native peoples in this period, of course, you get the incursions, intrusions of new, um, powerful or uh, potentially powerful invaders who are not only after the land, but they're making alliances with other Indian peoples and their power and presence and their trade goods uh, and their diseases are disrupting existing balances of power, changing the power dynamics, etc. How do Indian people deal with it? Well, one way they don't deal with it, I think, is to turn lockstep and face the Europeans. Because what we're looking at is not a single group of Native Americans who are all thinking the same, acting the same, but multiple uh, indigenous nations who are in different positions, have their own different relationships with other Indian nations and who forge their own relationships with the European nations. And so the model that I, I, I was um, tear down for my students in class is that notion of a white frontier steadily advancing east to west doesn't exist and, and suggests that they think of it rather as um, a mosaic or a, a kaleidoscope in which there are all these moving parts made up of Indian nations, European uh, powers, but also of course, different, colo different colonies. And Indian people are sometimes playing off the French against the English, against the Spanish, and then later against the Americans. But they're also very often cultivating relations with an individual colony against another individual colony. And the European powers and the different colonies are doing the same thing with, with Indian nations. Uh, so you get a group, uh, a nation or a coalition or a confederacy like the Choctaws, where they are actually able to play the field, right? um, where they can cultivate alliances with the French and the Spanish and the British and even the Americans. Um, and they do that because they want the trade, they want the, um, the promise of European help, but it means that they're never fully committed. But the fact that they've got all these feelers out to the Europeans means that each of those European powers feels like, well, they're kind of our allies. We can't go to war with them. Uh, and if we do, we'll likely push them into the, into the arms of our enemies. So it's a very, um, it's like shifting sands in which native diplomats, native leaders are often just as savvy, if not more so than a lot of the Europeans. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that does happen, of course, over time is that as the Euro-American Euro threat becomes greater and boils down to one and that a couple and then one major power named the United States, Indian nations kind of are doing the same thing. Right? They begin to uh, form their own coalitions so that the period of American history that we often call the Confederation era, where the states confederate, well, the same thing's going on west of the Ohio, where Indian nations west of the Ohio are forming their own confederation to resist the American Confederation. Mm -hmm. So it's this fascinating uh, and ever-changing diplomatic, political, and military landscape in which yesterday's enemies can be tomorrow's friends. And if you make friends with somebody, you're automatically going to make enemies of somebody else. Um, and I think that's a very different sort of view of Indian country than if we, if we assume that um, well, the question, well, why didn't the Indians all just fight against the whites? Um, mm -hmm. it's, it, it really doesn't work that way because that's, that's not, um, we're not talking about a race of people. 
we're talking about multiple nations, mm -hmm. each one with their own foreign policies, and those foreign policies change according to changing circumstances. Mm -hmm. And they were, the Native Americans were, many of them adept at playing these games before the revolution broke out to begin mm -hmm. with French and Spanish, etc. When developing relationships with the British and the French, I know in popular culture, people are familiar with uh, Sir William Johnson, who mm -hmm. really went to great lengths to try to cultivate the relationship with the Mohawk and the Iroquois. Could you talk a little bit about the role of a British superintendent of Indian affairs? And perhaps uh, was there a counterpart? Did the French also have superintendents yeah. of Indian affairs as well? Yeah. And the French have a, a reputation of cultivating um, effective relations with Indian people. And I think that's less to do with sort of French characters. It's sometimes assumed and it has to do with um, different circumstances. Um, the French empire and hopes of empire in North America were essentially built on the fur trade. And trading with Indians means you have to have Indian allies and Indian customers. And the French uh, physical and, and military presence in throughout Indian country is, is pretty minimal. So a lot of those outposts that the French have in the West exist and survive on the sufferance and tolerance and even the, with the permission and sometimes even at the invitation of Indian people who want trading posts there. Um, so it behooves the French to maintain good relations with Indian people. They don't really have the Indian department in the same way that the British do, but the, the British situation is somewhat different because whereas the French are lacking population, the British are seeing that population increase dramatically. And the difference being that whereas uh, French colonists in Canada are largely um, building a, uh, an empire on the fur trade, in the British colonies it's, it's on land right? and families are coming to settle Indian land. Well, if the fur trade needed Indians, settler colonists needs, need Indians to be absent. Right? You want to be getting rid of Indians. So that means that those relationships are going to be much more fraught. And yet the British realized as any imperial power who was ambitious of securing um, dominance in America, they needed Indian allies. They needed to be able to curtail their subjects from trespassing on Indian land and call it causing chaos and bloodshed, et cetera. Mm -hmm. And in the middle of the 1750s, the British moved to centralize their Indian operations with the creation of an Indian department and the creation of two um, superintendencies. Prior to that time, individual colonies had kind of done their own thing. So Pennsylvania would have an Indian policy, New York would have an Indian policy, which of course was one of the reasons why those Indian diplomats we were talking about were able to, I'll go visit Philadelphia, Mm -hmm. And then I'll go swing by Albany and make a cut a different deal with those people. Um, it was partly to eliminate those possibilities, but also to try and get a handle on the frontier, on westward expansion. And when the Indian Department was set up, Sir William Johnson was appointed superintendent for the north, and John Stewart was appointed superintendent for the southern district, for the Cherokees, Creeks, etc. Mm -hmm. And the hope was that this would bring more regularity and system to um, the, whole, um, the whole panorama of British Indian relations. Now, of course, people like John, William Johnson were interesting characters in their own right. Mm -hmm. They were like march or lords almost in, in medieval Britain because they had their own agendas and they'd made a position for them themselves. And Johnson um, had you know, built himself up a, um, a landed fortune in the Mohawk Valley. Um, he'd already, you know, starting life as a trader, he'd learned how to do business in Indian country. He'd learned the ropes. He'd, he'd learned the, uh, the importance of, of women in Mohawk society. And, and so he, he married or partnered well in, in that regard. And so often Sir William Johnson, who was be the face of the 
um, a British Indian policy in Indian country, could also be somebody who would um, drive his superiors nuts because he would sometimes do his own thing. Um, significantly, the Treaty of Fort Sandwich in 1768, where he exceeded his instructions and got far more land from the Iroquois than he was supposed to do, uh, which had ripple effects that led directly to the revolution. Mm -hmm. Wow. Well, just as the rebellious British colonies met as a Continental Congress to air their grievances and discuss common problems, the tribal nations also held Congresses of their own. There was one in 1765 and another in 1772. What were the purposes of these Native American Congresses? Did they accomplish anything? Yeah. And this goes back to your question earlier, Randy, about why the Shawnee. Right. So after, as the Treaty of Fort Stanwix, so William Johnson, the British, and the Iroquois made a treaty that, that estab essentially established the Ohio River as the boundary between British settlement and Indian land. That was a very effective move on the part of the Iroquois because it sent, it directed the westward movement of British settlement down the Ohio River. And that meant away from Iroquois country, which was upstate New York. Mm -hmm. The British Holland, the, the British government, Virginia, Pennsylvania, various hangers on, all did well out of this. The Iroquois did well out of this. The people who didn't do well out of this were the Cherokees and particularly the Shawnee, who claimed the, Ohio, the area south of the Ohio River, if you like Kentucky, as their hunting grounds. And say, so, wait a minute, we just got sideswiped here by a deal pulled off between the British and the Iroquois. Now, up until the middle of the 18th century, and perhaps even up to 1760s, the British had, through Sir William Johnson again, had largely operated through the Iroquois to conduct and control their Indian relations. The belief was, and the Iroquois encouraged this belief, that the Iroquois had dominance over tribes like the Hawaiians and the Shawnees and the Mohicans and various people. So for the British, this system worked. We've got Sir William Johnson in place. Sir William Johnson's got the Iroquois in his pockets. He can convey British policy to the Iroquois. The Iroquois will see that it's implemented in the Ohio country. Well, now after the Treaty of Fort Stanwix in 1768, the Shawnee is saying, wait a minute, we just got you know, yes. and, and so what the Shawnees start to do is actually begin to um, build a coalition of tribes who will exert their independence, right, from both the British and the Iroquois, because we're not doing well under this arrangement. And that growing coalition uh, then um, resists Virginian expansion into the, into the Ohio country. And then it's in place, or it's, it's, it's in process of becoming as when the revolution breaks out and then you have the Americans pushing into that one. So when the revolution ends, that coalition doesn't fall apart. It becomes the basis then for resistance against American expansion mm -hmm. beyond the Ohio River. And these are, I, I think, are very important uh, things to get at because unless we know what's been going on through all of this period, then after the revolution, when the American story of the settlement of, of the Ohio kicks in and American pioneers are being attacked in flatboats on the Ohio River, if we don't know that, that just looks like, well, that's what Indians do. Mm -hmm. Well, there's a reason they're doing that. Uh, and I think um, it's it behooves us to get a better grip on, on our history to, to look at what's motivating all of the parties in this. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, that's fascinating. Well, initially at the outset of the war, the Continental Congress attempted to keep tribal nations neutral, really, mm -hmm. in the conflict between you know, the American colonies and Great Britain. And even Benjamin Franklin spoke highly of the Iroquois form of government. But Thomas Jefferson, however, referred to Native Americans as savages, as you mentioned earlier, 
in our Declaration of Independence, you know, a document that we use to extol freedom and equality and independence and championing the rights of men. Why did the Congress abandon so quickly uh, the efforts to keep Indian country neutral? Yeah. And it wasn't only Congress that was trying to keep neutral. Lots of Indian nations were trying to keep neutral. Right? So even among the Shawnee, Cornstalk was the Shawnee um, chief was trying to keep his people neutral. Among the Delawares, there's a huge segment of the Delawares, particularly led by White Eyes, who uh, led his people into the treaty with Fort Pitt, who are trying to keep neutral. And for many Indian people, when they look at the revolution and see what's going on, they say, yeah, this is, this is about our land, but it's also a fight between British people, right? And as we all know, it's not a, you don't want to get involved in a domestic squabble, right? And so a lot of Indian people, leaders would say, well, we'll, we'll stay out of that. And that would have been their, their goal. Um, unfortunately, neutrality, particularly in somewhere like the Ohio country was very difficult because you had the British pulling on you and the Americans pulling on you. The Americans, I think very often opted in the early stages, opted for, um, argued for neutrality in large measure because they kind of assumed that most Indians would go inside with the British. Right? But the British at least had some record of trying to protect Indian land. And they had mm -hmm. people like Sir William Johnson or his, 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 his family who'd established working Indian relations and also had those kinship ties. So there's a lot of, a lot of influences that would seem to suggest that Indians would go with, with the British. Not all of them did. Stockbridge Indians didn't. The Oneidas among the Iroquois uh, sided with the Americans. But ultimately, a lot of them did. And partly it was because neutrality became unsustainable. But also it, became, it was in, in some measure because of something that was a kind of a constant in American frontier history. And that was the inability of the central government, whether it was in London or later in Philadelphia or Washington, to control what was happening on the, the frontier. Mm -hmm. um, so I mentioned two Indian leaders in the Ohio Valley, both of whom were um, proponents of neutrality, at least. White Eyes, I think, was actually more of a pro-American. But they were good friends of the Americans in the Ohio Valley. Both of them were killed. By Americans, by American militia. Mm -hmm. um, so that even people, leaders like Patrick Henry are tearing their hair out saying, what can we do? We're, we're bending over backwards to keep these Indians neutral. And yet our own citizens out on the frontier are murdering Indians. And of course, that just drives them into the arms of the British who've been telling them all along, the Americans are going to take your land and they're going to murder you. Um, and so it, it really breaks down, although there are some Indian people who try and keep neutral throughout the war, sometimes with tragic results, as happened with uh, a group of Delaware Indians who were Moravian con uh, converts at Nadenhutten who were massacred yeah. uh, toward the end of the war. Yeah. Uh, and some people who really just try and stay out. And then there are people, there are Indian peoples who uh, a consistent allies of the Americans. Uh, so it's a complex picture, but it, neutrality um, neutrality was not a good bet mm -hmm. in Indian country. Yeah. Well, you know, most American history books never mention that Native Americans participated in numerous battles of the Revolutionary War. And uh, why is that? In, could you name some of the engagements where Native Americans did play a prominent role? Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think, um, so the Museum of the American Revolution in Philadelphia, no, sorry, the Museum of the American Indian in, in Washington, there's a, there's a kind of large sculpture of George Washington, uh, the Oneida chief, um, Shenandoah, and an Oneida woman, Polly Cooper, uh, and she's holding a basket of corn. And it commemorates the Oneida trek from upstate New York to Washington's encampment at Valley Forge when the army was uh, starving, bringing corn. 
Now that's, um, that's a, a story that's very prominent and maybe central, I think, I believe, to the United sense of themselves during the American Revolution. But there's very little play in, uh, in the American story, in the, in the standard narrative. And I think part of the reason is um, that the American Revolution is in many ways a, is a creation story. Right? It's an origin story. Mm -hmm. Uh, and in that sense, if it was somebody else's, we'd call it a myth, but it's ours, by which, of course, with this accent, I mean yours, but I live here too, right? It's ours. Uh, and so those kind of stories are compelling and they're powerful, but they're usually pretty simple. And so in a story, if you're going to have a story um, that pits good against evil, it's pretty clear, right? But the Americans are fighting for freedom, the British are the bad guys, and the Indians are doing horrible things on the frontier, and they're in cahoots with, with, with the British. Um, and that's, uh, of course, there's some truth to that, but as, a, uh, as an accurate narrative, it's, it's hugely lacking. But if you, if you, dismant if you dismantle it or, or, or go beyond it, things get messy, things get complicated. Right? And you can't replace that clear and compelling narrative with another clear and compelling narrative. You're going to complete from, um, replace it with confusion. Right? I mean, I, I can't tell you how many times I've ended a class, you know, one of my classes in Indian history and said, so I look at a chalkboard and it's a mess. And says, so if you think this is all messy and you're kind of confused, that's the point. That's that, that was supposed to happen, you know. Uh, right. I think there are other reasons for it too, but I think it is. That's what we're looking at, and I think that's not. I don't want to be. I want to be quite clear. This is not setting myself to criticize the United States and American history. I think all nations have this. Yeah. They have their own stories, um, and for them to do the work that we expect of them, they have to be clear and compelling, and all of these other actors and all of these other experiences complicate things uh, in, a, in a disturbing way, I think. Mm -hmm. Well, it's a little bit of a follow-up to that. Uh, I know that the, we know that the, the Catawbas in South Carolina uh, fought the, with mm -hmm. Francis Marion in numerous battles in yeah. the South. Some are in the and, Continental and, Army. Yeah, yeah exactly. And, and of course, we talk about Oriskany a lot in mm -hmm. terms of, of that battle and, and then Blue Licks, of course, towards the end of the war in 1782. Yeah. Yeah. Are there any other uh, perhaps major engagements where the Native Americans were involved in working with or fighting against the, the Continental troops and that we just don't mention them at all, that they don't even hit the radar screen in our books at all? Are there are some things that we're missing, some major yeah. battles where the Native Americans really made a significant impact? Well, it, 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 there are Indians, of course, on the Saratoga campaign with mm -hmm. General Burgoyne, which is that famous incident um, with the, the uh, story of the murder of Jane McRae and right. how that um, plays out. Um, there are Indians figure prominently in, in British strategic thinking up in that area. Uh, they, they figure uh, in British strategic thinking in the South where the the British are actually trying to restrain the Cherokees in 1776, not yes. to say don't go to war against the Americans, don't go to war yet because we want to coordinate operations. <laughs> and there are um, instances, Siege of Pensacola and various things where Indians are involved. And there are instances where um, Indians are involved and but below the radar because they're not always involved as tribal nations. Sometimes they're just involved as Indian individual Indians. Mm -hmm. So the um, Daughters of the American Revolution many years ago started doing projects where they, a research project trying to identify minority soldiers who fought uh, in the Continental Army, you know, just African American and Native American. Mm -hmm. And a lot of these guys uh, are not they're not that easily identifiable right? because a little bit like Catawbas, they're now 
living cheek by jowl with many of the American neighbors. And if they sign up, they maybe don't have a recognizable Indian name. Although if you get a guy called Peter Indian, that's usually a clue. But lots of them wouldn't, you know, you, they need to be uh, identified through, through other means. But the other thing, of course, is that Indian people, uh, Indian people are fighting as allies of the British. They may be fighting as allies of the British, but they're not fighting for British interests. They're fighting for Indian interests. Mm -hmm. So they're not pawns of the British. They are fighting for their own agendas, their own interests, which really means defending their own lands, defending their own families, their own villages. So rather than being heavily involved on service in British campaigns, which would not really have been their style of fighting anyway, they're more often fighting, if you like, on the Western frontier, fighting Indian style, where actually both sides, um, in a sense, outsource their fighting. Right? Mm -hmm. You don't get British regiments in the Continental Army duking it out in pitched battles in Kentucky. But what you do get is American militia and loyalists and Indians fighting guerrilla warfare. It's almost like war by proxy. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. But for the Indian people, they're fighting, I think, their parallel wars, right? in which in some cases, they may be using the British as their allies rather than vice versa. Sure. Let's talk a little bit about the Sullivan campaign. Most Americans simply did not know, and you don't find it in very many history books, that in 1779, General Washington ordered Generals John Sullivan and James Clinton and Colonel Daniel Broadhead to lead military expeditions into Indian country to exterminate the Iroquois. What was the impact of those actions? Yeah. And the Haudenosaunee Iroquois people today, George Washington is still known as town destroyer, right? the father of our, our nation. And this, this is why. Um, and when I did the book on, on, the, on, on George Washington, I really got into George Washington's role in this campaign. And I really think it should be called Washington's campaign rather than Sullivan's campaign. Sullivan was the general, but Washington was the brains behind it. He was the guy who uh, conceived it, organized it. He, um, he was micromanaging it. He was doing research on this and he was pushing Sullivan, saying, you know, get going. Why aren't you further along? And he was also sending Sullivan explicit orders. And that was, you don't talk peace with these people. You do not accept peace emissaries until you've completed the job that I sent you there to do, which was to burn their villages, burn their crops, cut down their orchards. This is a scorched earth policy. And Washington uses the term extirpate. Um, now Washington, going back to the French and Indian War, and in keeping with a lot of other Indian fighters, believed that the only effective way to stop Indian raids on your people was to snuff them out at source. That is, you went into Indian country and you destroyed their homes and their crops. And this was not a new strategy. The French had done it, the British had done it, and now the Americans were doing it. If you went into Indian country looking for a fight with Indian people, you might experience what General Braddock experienced, and that is you're destroyed. Mm -hmm. right? So the more effective way to wage campaigns against Indian people was to destroy their food supplies and their home bases. Um, in the book on the revolution, I call these corn wars. Mm -hmm. And what Washington's campaign against the Iroquois country does is destroying massive amounts of Indian cornfields, massive amounts of food supplies. They uproot orchards, which take a long time to develop. And they burn uh, something like 40 Iroquois towns. And that is followed by the, what I believe is one of the coldest winters on record in upstate New York. So that Iroquois people are now left without food and shelter and they move west, and many of them take refuge at Fort Niagara. And I believe that was part of Washington's plan to create a refugee crisis for the British. 
mm -hmm. because the British couldn't feed them because Fort Niagara um, might be on a, a, a water supply route from Quebec and Montreal, but not in the middle of winter when it's frozen. Right. Um, so those refugee camps became um, disease camps, people suffering from hunger, et cetera, et cetera, mm -hmm. with the result that as soon as the spring comes, the first thing that Iroquois warriors from those places do is go back to the frontiers of Pennsylvania and New York raiding, raiding farmers, raiding settlements, because they have to go and raid for, for food. So it doesn't really work out in the way that, that Washington uh, wanted, but it is devastating in Indian country. And um, I think it is also possible to look at this campaign not as a purely defensive campaign on the part of Washington. We need to retaliate against the Iroquois for our attacks on us, but a way of establishing claim to that territory mm -hmm. once the war is over. Because Washington didn't know in 1779 how the Peace of Paris was going to work out. I think by then France was already in the war. It was a pretty good bet that independence could be secured, but on what terms? And Washington understood that America, the United States, needed to acquire the land beyond the Appalachians. Uh, the rich farmlands of Iroquois country, the Ohio Valley, as it, for its future as a nation, for an expanding nation. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Well, you identify many great leaders throughout Indian country during this time. Uh, you know, names like Joseph Brandt are well known throughout movies and popular culture, but there were many other leaders on both sides. Uh, who, in your opinion, were some of the most influential tribal leaders. Do you have some favorites that you'd like to share with us? Um, I'm not sure if I have favorites, but favorites, but there's, there, you're right, there's a whole sort of galaxy of Indians. I mean, we look at this period in American history, and one of the things that's fascinating about it is that you've got the found, founding fathers and all these interesting, charismatic, amazing characters, right? Books on the founding fathers in every, every bookstore. I think you can look at Indian country and you can see the same thing. I mean, Joseph Brandt uh, is a, um, a remarkable individual by anybody's standards, right? Uh, I, you know, I first came across Joseph Brandt's letters when I was a graduate student doing research in, in the British Museum and the Colonial Office records in London many, many years ago when this is how many years ago it was, they brought you the actual manuscripts. So they'd bring me a bundle of manuscripts, I'd work through them during the day. And I learned to recognize Joseph Brandt's handwriting. And I looked forward to a Joseph Brandt letter because he'd been educated by Eliezer Wheelock and he wrote with a much neater, clearer hand than half of these honyaks in the British Indian department who, Use creative spelling, shall we say, right? Um, so Brandt was a remarkable individual, translated, worked on translating the gospel into Mohawk, and yet is seen as the terror of the frontier. Um, Shawnee leaders like Cornstalk and Blue Jacket who were in, influential in um, the development of that, those, those coalitions. Uh, Dragon Canoe, uh, who leads a, a kind of an independent, what I see almost as an independence movement within the Cherokee side of the younger warriors who um, separate and move west to Chickamauga to continue the fight for independence after uh, the older, older chiefs have, have made peace. Uh, Piominko, a mountain leader of the Chickasaws, uh, who's not so much directly involved in the fighting in the revolution, but emerges as a, as a key diplomatic player after the revolution. And it could be that, um, you know, it could be kind of, what is it they say, come the moment, come the man, right? That mm -hmm. this, is a, this was a crisis time for the American colonists and it produces this galaxy of leaders. Well, this was also crisis time in India. Alexander McGillivray among the Creeks, who's another interesting guy who's um, by heritage is, is predominantly uh, Scottish, um, but he's Creek uh, because he's um, 
his clan membership descends through the maternal life uh, line as, as happens in Creek country and is a very astute diplomat um, and is recognized as such by the British, by the Spaniards, by George Washington. Um, so Indian leaders are not all tomahawk wielding warriors committing mayhem on the, on the frontier. This is a this is a crisis, I call it a crisis in the subtitle of the book, I think. This is a crisis that involves, uh, it has multiple dimensions and it generates multiple responses from Indian leaders. Um, and I think looking, you know, plucking out those individuals is a good way of getting at that. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Well, what's the one thing that you'd like readers to take away from your book? You know, the... American Revolution in Indian Country. What's yeah. the major major thought that they need to think about? Major major impact. I would say that the American Revolution was a revolution or an event for all Americans. Mm -hmm. And that that doesn't sound like rocket science or anything you know too amazing. But if you if we accept that as a starter, then we, I think, quite quickly realize that a lot of the standard narratives, certainly popular culture of the revolution are really not satisfactory. That's not to say they're wrong or to, to demean them in any way, but they're only telling a part of the story. And you know, I like to use the, uh, the saying, I'm not sure. I've used it so many times, I think it's mine, but I'm sure it's not. It, it's probably somebody like w Ralph Waldo Emerson, who actually complained about this, said, you know, that we're, we're, we're telling an American history that's a shallow village tale. Um, I kind of believe, you know, great nations deserve great histories. And we should be able to look at our history, good and bad, black and white, all dark side and everything else, uh, heroes and villains and, um, and own it and acknowledge it. Right? And I don't think that that necessarily means that if we do that, if we confront our history honestly, that we're somehow jettisoning our patriotic values. Right. Which is something sure. that's supposed to be suggested. I would say it's a patriotic duty that we should understand our history as fully and as completely and as comprehensively as we can. And that involves, requires thinking about and acknowledging the experiences, contributions, sufferings uh, of lots of people who don't make it into the, into the men into the men's story. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, you just really answered my last question there as well, because I was going to ask you specifically, what can we do today, you know, to specifically educate our citizens, our young people about Native Americans and their role in founding this nation? Do you have any final thoughts about that? Yeah. Um, the one thing I would say, uh, I spent most of my life studying Native American, Native American history and you may have noticed I'm not Native American, um, but I th and I think, but I think we can do a lot, and I think we can do a lot into understanding that history by, first of all, treating people with respect, treating their cultures with respect. Right? And that's difficult when Thomas Jefferson says they're savages. Mm -hmm. so we've got to work beyond that. And I think a, a key piece to doing that that I think works has worked for me is what's the first thing you do? First order of business, if you like. Assume that these people are human beings. Right? They're going to act and think as human beings. Now, cultural imperatives may do may require them to do some things differently they may understand some things differently but essentially they're going to make decisions that are in their own best interest 
which means usually not selfish self-promotion. It means looking after the wife and kids, right? It means taking care of the people that you love, keep taking care of your homeland, doing those kinds of things. And often, if we just do that, then when we look at Native American history, often as it's recorded in, in, in history books, a lot of what they're doing makes no sense. Now, if we just say, well, what they're doing makes no sense, well, that's because they're Indians, right? Then we're getting nowhere. Right? But if we say, okay, why are they doing that? And look at it through the, the lens of a common humanity, then often I think you'll find, I found, it does make sense. I mean, one of the things that I found early on in my own research was the British were always calling the Indians fickle. You couldn't rely on them, damn it, to do the right, you know, they'd say they'd do one thing and do the other. Well, of course, what the British meant by fickle and unreliable or even treacherous meant that the Indians weren't doing what the British wanted them to do. The Indians were doing what they wanted to do. And when you looked at it, why would they, why would they abandon the British, fight with the French, and then make peace with the British? Uh, what are they doing? Well, if you look at them, where's the consistency? What they're trying to do is protect their families and their homelands. So you take the, the steps that do that most effectively. And I think that um, for those of us who are not from a Native American heritage and have no special um, claim to understand um, Native American history or culture, I think that, that, that can be a useful start. Mm -hmm. Wow. Well, Professor Colin Calloway, thank you so much for joining me today on The Real American Revolution. And to our viewers and listeners, you can obtain a copy of Professor Calloway's book, The American Revolution in Indian Country, which is available on Amazon and other wonderful outlets. So join us again next time when The Real American Revolution brings you another discussion of what really happened during our American Revolution. My name is Randy Flood. Professor Calloway, thank you again for joining us. Thank you, Rhonda. It's my pleasure. And so long for now.